So we're very, again, we're very excited to have Steve join us here today. A uh, little backstory before uh, he gets into it. This presentation, this meetup has been a year in the making. So imagine yourself back at TC19. Uh, Steve and I were there hanging out at a late night establishment. Uh, and Steve came up and said, hey, Sean, you work you, you're at uh, you're in Kansas City, right? I said yes, and he said I've always wanted to go there and, and do some present presenting there. So I want to come and present to your to your tug group. Fantastic! Let's set it up. Let's do it. And then you all know what happened. We had it set up. It was ready, and then COVID hit. Uh, and then it was like uh, we can't travel. What's the deal with virtual tugs? We don't know yet, and so we kind of postponed that. And then Steve and I have been uh connected on twitter for a while so we've been communicating back and forth i reached out around uh the first of the year again i said hey you want to come back you want to try this again and he said actually i have a new book coming out and it comes out in may how about how about something around that time and i said yep absolutely that works well today's the day kansas city today is the day steve wexler is coming to kansas city to talk so steve thank you for doing this and we can't wait to uh, wait. Can't wait to hear what you have to tell us about. Well, Sean, delighted to reconnect with you and your colleagues. Sorry, this isn't in person uh, for a variety of reasons, but it will be soon enough. Um, and also, uh, you know, curious about that whole cahoot and the tests and the uh, recommendations, etc. Uh, by the way, I would not have. I would not have won that thing. I'm going. <laughs> Really, seven different colors? That many? Mm, that's that's a, uh, and and also, what's the best way to show a timeline? Well, does it, or you know, visualize time? Well, does it have to be a timeline? Yeah, probably <laughs> most of the time. So it it doesn't get easier, folks. It gets harder because you end up going well. But this may be one of those cases where that's not what we should be doing. Uh, in any case, let me share my screen and let's discuss some stuff together. And particularly, how to use data visualizations to make better decisions faster. And this is really, you know, here are some things every business person should know about data visualization. I'm talking very much about the consumer of the charts and dashboards that you'll be creating. So yes, you should know about it, but there's just a bunch of stuff that wouldn't it be great if everyone in your organization embrace some of this stuff already. You didn't have to get them over the learning curve. Uh, so very briefly about me, I'm the founder and principal and sole employee of Data Revelations. I was Tableau's inaugural Iron Viz champion. That was a ridiculously long time ago. Um, I'm a Tableau Zen master, quote unquote, hall of fame. Uh, if you're in the Tableau community, you know that Tableau Zen master is an actual thing. If you're not in the Tableau community, I hand you a business card that says Tableau Zen Master, and you look at it and go, God, this guy is a complete tool. What guy puts Zen Master on his own business card? Uh, it is a real thing. And I'm certainly very proud of being an Iron Viz champion and a Tableau Zen Master. But within the data visualization community, the thing or things I'm most proud of, well, first is being one of the three authors on the big book of dashboards. And for the past two years plus, I've been working on a new book called The Big Picture, whose subtitle happens to be the same as the title of this presentation, How to Use Data Visualization to Make Better Decisions Faster. Um, any of you who have attended one of my workshops, or maybe you've attended another presentation, know that I show a slide like this virtually every time I give a talk. And that is, you are encouraged to disagree with me. Good things happen when we debate these things, when you go, hey, I'm not seeing it that way. I'm seeing it a little bit differently, or maybe this is a better way to do it. The forum for disagreeing isn't ideal. You know, I'm a panelist, most of the people here aren't, but in the Q&A and in the chat, you are definitely welcome to um, pipe in with your opinion, especially when it doesn't ring true to your own experience. So I'm going to show you five or six things that I just wish every business person got. And one is why just showing the numbers isn't good enough. 
Um, I'll ask my workshop attendees, how many of the people for whom you're creating charts and dashboards, how many people in your organization just say, you know what, I, I just want to see the numbers. Just show me a spreadsheet. Or you make this amazing interactive dashboard and they ask you, hey, can you, um, uh, can you, you give me a link so I can download the CSV file for this? And well, why is it that they just want to see the numbers? And, and here's kind of an amalgam of, of every client I've had over the last 15 year that kind of 15 years that kind of adheres to this, you can have my spreadsheet when you pry it from my cold, dead hands. And, and, and it just may be that they're very comfortable with numbers, but they're not so comfortable with reading what may be for you super simple, but for them, they haven't seen just how much more insight they might be able to glean from this stuff. So maybe you start to walk them through some examples and say, look, we're here to try to glean insights faster. So for example, this typical spreadsheet, 12 months of data, three different categories. Overall, you can ask them this question, which category overall has the highest sales and which has the lowest sales? And they'd say, hey, come on, this is simple. All I have to do is just put a total at the end, sum them up, and I can see corporate is the highest and education is the lowest. Okay, five points for the spreadsheet lovers there. They're right. Now ask another question, and what I would argue is a very reasonable one. When was that not case? In what month or months was corporate not the highest? And did it dip, dip a lot or a little? Did it dip from first to second or first to third? How about anything else that was happening? Well, a line chart makes this abundantly clear. By the way, this is, I particularly like the way this one was put together because there's no color legend. This is like direct labeling. Instead of having to go, what does orange mean? Oh, the, 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 what each line represents is right there. But look how much easier it is to see these things. Plus, as good as this is at answering the question, when did it go from, when was it not top? And when was um, education not bottom? Um, it also begs the question, whoa, what happened in March? Did that happen last year? Is this something we can expect? Is this something that we can prevent next year? So a really good data visualization shouldn't just answer questions, it should pose new questions. In any case, here is the first example and the, the spreadsheet, and here's a much clearer way to be able to see the same data. But they still may not buy into this. It still may be, yeah, but I'm so comfortable with the numbers. So I want to introduce you to the highlight table, or what I call the gateway drug to data visualization. So I will show you a data set with which you are probably so familiar. It's the Superstore data set. And what I've got here is a cross tab or a spreadsheet. And I've got four regions along the top and 17 different product subcategories. And if I were to ask you, Hey, spreadsheet lover, um, over which combination of region and product subcategories has the, is the least profitable and which is most profitable? This takes time because you got to go sequentially through all 68 cells that are here and you got to kind of remember which ones. And you know, maybe the fastest person I've ever seen do it and get it right was maybe 10, 12 seconds. And there are your answers. Tables in the East is the lowest and office machines in the South is the highest. Well, look how much easier this is if we color code the cells. In Tableau, this is called a highlight table. It's a heat map where you show the numbers. In Excel, they call this uh, conditional formatting. Bam, that is so easy. Look at tables that you can see table. Not only can you see best, um, dark orange, worst, dark blue, best. Yeah, I'm using blue and orange because I'm a New York Mets fan. You Kansas City Royals folks, we're still holding a grudge against you. In any case, the but you can also see tables is doing poorly almost in every category. Binders and accessories are doing great, but you can really see where office machines are popping out. And, and I have yet to see any person who loves spreadsheets not like this, because from the back of the room, I don't even have to be able to see the numbers 
the best and the worst just scream for attention. Well, let's take this a little bit further. By the way, remind me to tell you what is what is behind this data set because there's a um, at this point uh, an interesting story. At the time, it was a very painful story. Um, but what I've got here is a, a highlight table and showing the volume of technical support calls that we're receiving. So I've got the day of the week along the top and I've got the hour of the day along the left side. And you can see some you know, serious pockets of activity. You can see, ooh, you know, where it's dark, there's a lot of uh, technical support calls. Where it's light, there are far fewer. So, okay, highlight table's great. Suppose somebody wants to know what day of the week gets the most calls, what day of the week gets the fewest calls, what hour of the day gets the most, what hour of the day gets the fewest, and this is where I strongly recommend you add a marginal histogram, and technically, I'm not going to get into what's the difference between a histogram and a bar chart, and um, well, I'll show you what the thing looks like. Technically, the thing that goes along the right side, that's a histogram. The thing along the bottom is just a bar chart. And I'm not going to get into the particulars. Look how useful this is, that I can see immediately. I can see where the biggest one and where the smallest one is, and I can see how much bigger or smaller it is. Now, the spreadsheet lover may say, hey, why didn't you just add totals to the table? Well, then you're, sc you're scanning through numbers and trying to remember, is this a big number or a small number? And when you color code it, you run into a problem because the color coding for the totals is going to be so much larger than the color coding for inside the table. But let me get into why the bars for the histogram are so much more effective than just color. Let me just focus on 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. Okay. I bet you all of us can clearly see that 11 a.m. is about twice as large as 10 a.m. Well, how do we know that? Well, we can see one number is 1376 and the other number is 672, and that's about twice as big. What happens if I take the number out? Come on, man, you're going to tell me you can tell that that's twice as orange as the other orange? But look what happens with the bar chart. Okay? The numbers are right there. I take it out. I can see it's twice as big. By the way, this is a great test to see how good your visualization is. Can you remove the mark labels? Can you remove the numbers and still be able to make sense out of it? By the way, here's a cool quote, going back to you know the dark orange and the lighter orange. Uh, we can say that one shade is darker than the other. That is obvious. But to say that it is two or three times as dark is not visible. It is not readable. And that was said by Charles, but or written by Charles Bernard in 1861. You know, the guy who did this chart. And if you haven't seen that chart, I'm going to be showing it to you um, because I have a love-hate relationship with this chart. Right. Speaking of charts and seeing the bars that we saw before, why the f do we see so many bar charts? Well, it seems to be like the default on so many things. Well, I'm curious, this is kind of a rhetorical question here with this, but who thinks bar charts are boring? Well, and I'm just gonna imagine at least several hands going up. And here's my answer to that. It's not your bar chart, it's your data that's boring. And in my head, I hear Lewis Black kind of spitting that out. And, and to an extent, there's something to be said for that. If you feel that, gee, the data is clear, but it's boring, and I have to make it more interesting, you're going to go down a really bad path. But you may get some of your stakeholders saying, this is boring, can't you liven it up, make it way more interesting, uh, pack bubbles look really cool, oh, you know, it's even better, word clouds, do a word cloud on this thing. So let, let's kind of discuss the, the what happens. Here is 17 different categories here, and here's sales data. And if you let your tool do what it wants to do, and in this case, this is a Tableau user group, and just you know, let Tableau do its best practice, it wants to create an easy to read, straightforward bar chart. But if you end up clicking the show me button and experimenting a bit, you may create something that looks like this. Now, 
if I were to ask you which one is more interesting to look at, yeah, you're right. The one on the right's more interesting. Which one can answer questions like what's second from the top, third from the bottom? Oh, that gets pretty hard with the packed bubbles. But the other thing is the reason you see bar charts, you are just good at being able to make accurate comparisons without training. And you, meaning you, a human being, are probably not very good at gauging the size of uh, circles compared with the length of bars. Um, let me prove it to you. Why don't you give this a try? Go to bigpick.me front slash estimate. And I, I've conducted this with over 3,500 people. I want you to guess how big is that green circle and how big is that blue bar? And I'll give you like 20, 25 seconds to do this and see how you do. And how many people have the theme from Jeopardy going in their heads right now? I know I do. A little trivia here. Both the game show and the theme song were both created by the same man. Merv Griffith. All right. And all right, let's see how you did. So this is, by the way, as of earlier today, um, we'll see how many more responses we got from the uh, 3,748 that are here. Um, but take a look at this. So the correct answer for the circle is 50. This is half as big. Look how few got it right, only 39% got it right. And in fact, more people, way more people got it wrong. Most people overestimated the size of it, handful of people underestimated it. Now look, almost twice as many people nailed the size of the bar. And, and you look at the distribution of guesses, only a handful of people guessing too low, a handful of people guessing too large. And when asked which was easier, uh, uh, which was harder to estimate, estimate, 95% um, of people said that this is more difficult. Let's see how this group did. Uh, data, data, refresh all extracts here. Hopefully this will cooperate. So we started at 3,748. Okay, so 12 responses from this group. Let me just look at today's responses only. Oh, I've gotten some of other people responding today. Uh, since I posted this publicly. So sorry, I just couldn't look at this particular group to see how much smarter you are than you know, all the other people out there. But, you're, but today's group is kind of making my point. People are nailing um, the bar, but having a lot of trouble with the area of the circle. So let's go back to this. Yeah, you can... You can see when I first put, did this back in September 2019, only had 1,500 responses. But humans are just inherently good at judging the length of bars from a common baseline. We're not terribly good at judging the area of circles. And this brings me to a quote by a colleague, uh, Andy Kirk, who wrote a book called Data Visualization. What is data visualization? It's the representation and presentation of data that exploits our visual perception abilities in order to amplify cognition. And that's a very articulate way of putting this. I will not be nearly as articulate and just say data visualization, it, when done well, it takes advantage of things people do well and it avoids things people do poorly. Just getting back to this circle thing, um, I first saw this concentric circle example presented by Professor Matthew Kay from um, University of Michigan. And how, what percentage of the larger circle is the smaller circle? Rhetorical question, you don't have to answer it here. And, and if you ask most people, gee, what, what percentage is the small of the big? They'd say probably 75%. 
I know the answer. I know what this is. And even though I know the answer, it looks like, yeah, it looks like to be about three quarters. It's half. The light blue circle is half the area of the large blue circle. We're just not good at this. Now, your takeaway should not be, oh, bar is good, circle is bad. Circles can be great. Circles are great on this map. They're just not very good for helping you make accurate uh, comparisons. So uh, I will show this in my workshops and, and ask, what is this a map of? And, and there's usually some Weisenheimer who says, the United States. Okay, yes, it's a map of the 48 contiguous states. What am I trying to show here? And usually the first thing people say population because they see the big blob for California. And then very quickly they realize, oh, it's not electoral results or population because Oregon and Washington would not have big blobs. California would have a big blob. Texas would have a big blob. Florida would have a big blob. Then they start guessing various things. Um, rainfall, startups, per capita income. Uh, my favorite was um, um, recreational use of marijuana, in which case, well, Colorado would be a larger blob, wouldn't it be? Then the kicker, I tell them, I have no idea what this is a map of. And, it, and I made it six, seven years ago, I forgot to put a title on it, but whatever it's about, you know, way more is happening on the West Coast than in other places. So it's, it's useful. So maybe on a dashboard, you get this kind of big picture type of thing with the bombs, but when you want the accurate comparisons, you'll have the bars. So let's get back to the question, why the F do we see so many bar charts? And I wanna share with you how I watch movies. So watching this Netflix movie from 2019, 2018, Dolomite is my name, starring Eddie Murphy. He plays this um, kind of raunchy comedian who goes on the road, it make, makes record albums, he's on the road supporting them, and he realizes he wants to make a movie of this stuff. You know, make it once, sell it a lot of times. Um, and no one wants to finance, let alone distribute his movie. So he decides he's going to finance his own movie. He makes the movie, but no studio will distribute it. He rents a movie theater for a single late night show. Very dangerous thing. You know, a lot of money he's putting behind this thing and using advanced royalties. He may be in debt to his record company for the rest of his life. The show sells out, but there's no distributor. Cut to next scene where we see a sleazy movie producer played by Bob Odenkirk from Better Call Saul. He opens up Variety Magazine, the trade magazine for entertainment. And he starts looking at something and he sees this table full of numbers and it absolutely astounds him. He sees 98% and he sees what's responsible for it. He looks up, turns to the camera and says, what the F -ity F? Well, would you have seen this? Here's my best attempt to resurrect or, or reconstruct this table full of numbers. You really have to work to find where the outlier is. How about now? Can you see where the outlier is? I'm, I'm, look, rhetorical question, of course you can. Here, let me really drive it home. Still can't see it? It's that one. So why are we, do we see so many bar charts? Because it gets us to what the effity F so much faster. That said, if you get pushback from your stakeholders, your audience, and saying, well, the bars are heavy and they're boring, there are alternatives that work fine and they play into what humans do well. A Cleveland dot plot, or just a dot plot works great, or a lollipop chart works great. So in trying to get you to get this and hopefully arming you with information that will help your stakeholders, help them see just how amazingly it is for them to answer certain questions using uh, bar charts or the, the similar forms, you know, the dot plot or the lollipop chart. Show them how adding color in some cases can make that table full of numbers, the important things really jump out. Well, let's get into color issues. This is where Jeff and I 
are in complete agreement. I think Andy Cotgrave is as well. This is with the number one uh, infraction in data visualization is the misuse of color. So here is a chart that uh, is in the big picture. There's a similar one in the big book of dashboards. This is in fact, everything you need to know about color and data visualization. And Jeff and I laugh, we go, that's, yes, that's an oversimplification. That's kind of like saying, here's everything you need to know to be able to compose music. But really this is the, the five ways that you can use uh, color in data visualization, categorical, sequential, diverging, highlight, and alert. I'm going to focus on categorical as this is where I see people making the big, biggest mess up. And, and I'm, I get very concerned when I see more than four categorical colors. So my, I'm, I kind of question that seven from the uh, little quiz that we had early on. There, it may be warranted. I'm not saying it's not. It's just, it's raising some flags. So let me set you up. I did this for the first time um, at the European Tableau Conference. It was 2019 in Berlin. And there were about a thousand people in the room. And I said, okay, midpoint of the room, I want half of you to close your eyes. The other half, I'm gonna show you something for five seconds. Look at it and see if you draw any conclusion. So, you, you know, you don't have to close your eyes or if you wanna do that, you can. So I'm gonna show something for five seconds. Those of you who choose to look at it, see if you can draw a conclusion. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, now they swap. They say, you had your eyes open, close them. Your eyes are closed, uh, now open them. And I show this other group this. One, two, three, four, five. And I'll ask the first group, what conclusion did you reach? Really hoping the first answer, you know, isn't something like, you know, sales on Tuesday is the highest. And so I, if what I wanna hear is, sales on the weekends are lower than any other day, sales on Saturday and Sunday. And I'll ask, how many people in the first group saw that? 80% of hands go up. I'll ask the second group, how many people in this group saw that? Barely any hands go up. Conclusion, the first group is obviously more intelligent than the second group. No, this is what they each saw. In the first group, color, is telegraphing what you should look at. Come on, tell me you can't, you, it's, you're not looking at Saturday and Sunday because everything else is gray. On the version on the right, you have to, color does nothing. You have to fight color to try to find where a conclusion is. By the way, the whole curating results and hitting people over the head, if this were in a presentation, I might curate it and call something out like this. But the effective use of color, number one infraction, and you're probably going to get people saying this is not colorful enough and saying, well, actually, that's probably not going to help us conclude anything by just adding a whole bunch of colors. Here's the other thing that your stakeholders should be asking for and you should be doing for them. How do you make dashboards irresistible and change behavior? Make the dashboard about your stakeholder. Make stuff, insert them into the narrative. People want to know stuff about themselves. And if you can do that, you can't, you can't always do it, but if it's like, oh, hey, I've got a dashboard comparing um, uh, the productivity of different divisions. Let me make it that each stakeholder, each, each, you know, when they log in, they see how their division is doing versus everybody else. Let me uh, show you a fun case uh, in point. This is a histogram, because I have things binned along the bottom in same increments, um, showing the age distribution of people in the United States as of 2019. The way to read this is, oh, zero, the, the, those are newborns, and there are roughly, you know, 3.8 million of them. And 30-year-olds, uh, there are roughly, you know, 4.7 million of them. And I look at this and go, whoa, what happened there between like 72, 73? What, suddenly everybody's dying? I think this is fascinating. Most of my friends and family kind of go, oh, this is boring, man. So I've got, this is up on my website, datarevelations.com. I, I was inspired by a colleague of mine who did something similar for Are You Over the Hill 
it, this is the United States, he did a, are you over the hill in Canada? And you put your age in and see how much older or younger you are than others. By the way, this is depressing if you're older than, older than 50. Um, you discover just how much older you are than other people in the United States. But you, you end up putting your age in, your partner's age in, your parents, your kids, my older brother in, and stuff like that. And, and, and all the, the stuff that was boring is now fascinating because it's within a context that you care about. Um, by the way, if you're curious about this, that's not people dying. It's people being born after 1946. That's the cusp of the baby boom generation. So here's another example. How is the store I'm doing managing compared to all other stores? And whoever is managing store S34, so the director would be able to see everybody, but the store managers, they can only see themselves. And they know, well, someone's doing really well. I can't tell who that is or who that is. But this person's probably feeling kind of bummed out because overall, they're like 14 out of 15. So maybe the director meets with this person and says, hey, let's, let's talk about how we can improve things. In fact, um, you're really stumbling in cleanliness and staff knowledge. I'm going to have you speak with some of the top performers and find out what they're doing. So next month, they see something that looks like this that shows all their progress. It's like, boy, that feels really pretty good. You know, I've made a lot of progress. And this, this dashboard that's showing performance and how they're doing, it, it becomes magnetic. They want to look at it. They can't wait until the update is there to see, to see how they're doing. I, I have found this more than anything else. Um, I, I don't have great design skills, but I found if I make my audience the star of the dashboard, they're very likely to use it. By the way, I'm not the only one who's, you know, kind of figured out people want to know stuff that's relevant to them. Um, amazing that this is only from February, but this was, oh yeah, I got to look at this. You know, when am I going to get a vaccine or be able to get a vaccine? And you could say how old you were, where you lived, all this type of stuff. And then it will say, oh, based on what you put in, here's where you are online. A couple more things to uh, be looking at and thinking about with this, how am I doing versus everybody else? Um, and the importance of maybe having disaggregated data. So here's this salary comparison thing. You can like put in your salary and see how you compare with the average of everybody else. So I don't know if maybe this should be a bar, maybe these should both be circles instead of these bars in this circle. But how pissed off are you in looking at this? You're seeing, okay, your salary is like 83, 84,000, and the average of everybody else is like 112,000, something like that. You know, are you miffed? Are you a little pissed off? Don't know. Let me show you the same data, but using disaggregated data. And where, oh my God, wait a minute, what's going on here? Oh, this is the upper quartile, the median, the lower quartile. And here's me, or here's you. And you realize, gee, this didn't really look so bad. But in fact, I'm in the bottom core time. So just be aware of what's being masked when you just have summary data. By the way, if you've not seen this type of construct before, it's just a jitter plot. I'm going to explain how it works and explain why I'm so high on it and, and like it so much. Let me give you the setup. This is now eight years ago. And I'm working with a major healthcare company. It has data on thousands of different companies and millions of employees and their families. And it was, um, and what they were looking at was incidents of various diseases and how if the employees and their families could be compliant, meaning they took their drugs they were supposed to take, they were doing the, the mindful of the diet they needed to be on, the healthcare savings and life savings, but how do you get buy-in? How do you get the organization where there's a big incidence of problem to really take this seriously? This wasn't working. Incidence of diabetes. In your organization, it's 18.5%. The average of all organizations like yours was 4.9%. How do we get this to really work? So we started with this. Strip pot. Here are 790 different organizations, each represented by a dot. You want to be, a, you know, dots at the bottom 
the incidence is low, dots at the top, that's a high incidence of diabetes. Well, then we jittered the dots just so that you could, uh, there's no difference between a dot that's to the left and a dot that's to the right. It's how high they are. It just allows you to see, oh, there, I can really see there aren't a lot of dots up here, but there are a whole lot of dots down here. Right? Then we show this demarcation point. Anything above this line, you're in the worst 1%. Here's where your company is. Wow, the effect that that had. And, and that's, I got hooked on what a good data visualization, one that really put the audience into the narrative, what that could do, because it changed the way they thought about things. The, 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 the reaction was palpable. And I got very excited about what a good data visualization could do. All right. What you should always be thinking about as you're crafting data visualizations. Um, I showed you a still from Dolomite. I'm gonna show you a, pr a production still from a TV show called Night Gallery. Night Gallery was created by Rod Serling, the same guy that created The Twilight Zone. This was a, you know, an anthology series. I saw this episode when I was a kid. It was called Hell's Bells. Freaked me out. Um, this really bad guy, this hippie looking dude played by John Aston, who plays Gomez on the Adams family. In any case, he's in a car crash. He winds up in hell. Actually, he winds up in the waiting room to hell, but he's excited. He wants to see the fire, wants to see the brimstone. He wants to see all this type of stuff. You know, Hieronymus Bosch, he can't wait. Instead, he's in this waiting room with these bumpkins, listening to vapid music, people telling boring stories about crop rotation. And he says, hey, enough with this waiting room. When do I get to see hell? And Satan appears, says, well, hell is never what you expect it to be. But for you, this is it. It's a curious thing. But they have the exact same room up there. You see, while this room is absolute hell for you, up there, it's someone else's idea of heaven. So wait a minute. So the same place that is somebody's heaven is somebody's Look, I'm 12, 13 years old. Of course, it's going to you know, mess with me. But it brings me to this chart, which if you haven't seen it, at some point you will. Why? Because this guy, Edward Tufte, in his 1983 book, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information, said, this may be the best statistical graph ever drawn. And, and I think holding this thing up that way? Well, let me hold my thoughts for a minute. In any case, let me very quickly show you how to interpret this thing. First of all, here's a re-rendering of it done in English. Um, this is Napoleon's attempt to conquer Russia between 1812 and 1813. And you say, map? This doesn't really look like a map. Here, here it is superimposed on modern day, starting in Lithu uh, Lithuania in Kosovo or Kaunas and going to Moscow. And how do we read this thing? Well, here's where Napoleon started. And a little hard to see here with this thing, but that's, he starts with 422,000 troops. The thickness of the line is how many troops there are. And the troops are starting to go east. This, you'll notice the, the thick, the, the line is getting thinner. Some go north. Some head to Polotsk, but the thinness is happening. Napoleon's losing troops in battle and because the Russians are employing a scorched earth um, campaign where they're destroying everything in their way. So there, there aren't proper supplies. Eventually Napoleon gets to Moscow. He's down to 100,000 troops. He waits for a month, hoping that the, um, the emperor We'll sign a, a peace, uh, we'll submit, not a peace treaty, but we'll capitulate. Never happens. Napoleon has no choice but October 18th to retreat. And down here, we see the temperature during the retreat. The warmest day during the retreat. By the way, it was originally displayed in the Ramur scale, which went from zero to 80, but with this uh, English language recreation shows it in Celsius and Fahrenheit. So this is the retreat. 
If you're wondering why does the line get thick here, those troops that went north come south? Same thing that happened over here. And when Napoleon returns, and at times it went down to like minus 38 Celsius, just wickedly cold, Napoleon ends up with only 10,000 troops. And, and I think of this thing through a modern prism of, you know, what are the requirements? Uh, show on the map where the campaign started and ended. Show where the troops traveled. Show how many troops were alive at key points in the journey and make it clear which line depicts the onslaught and which depicts the retreat. By the way, this kind of makes it look like uh, the retreat was done underneath, done south. It was just made it, it, it wasn't. It was done over the same path. It was just easier to show it as separate lines. In the case, going back to this, um, the weather was a big factor during the retreat. Make sure to show the temperature during key parts of the return. When you highlight those key parts, we know the date. You need to know the date as well. Oh, by the way, it all has to fit on a mobile device. So hold the thoughts on this greatest uh, statistical chart ever drawn for a minute. Let me show you another one that's often shown. Chart that changed the British healthcare system. Florence Nightingale's rose chart or wedge chart, or sometimes called the coxcomb, showing that changing the sanitary conditions um, at the Scutari um, uh, army base or army camp um, dramatically decreased the mortality of injured soldiers. I'm not expecting you to necessarily understand how to read um, this um, uh, exotic chart, but some of my very learned colleagues have said, critics suggest that Nightingale's mortality data is better shown in something more straightforward like a bar chart. But this is not true. Florence Nightingale made lots of bar charts. No one cares about them. Her roses gripped 1858 readers, and they still hold our attention today. Okay, that's from R.J. Andrews, who wrote Info We Trust, from Alberto Cairo, The Functional Art, The Truthful Art, and How Charts Lie. I believe Nightingale's goal wasn't just to inform, but also to persuade with an intriguing, unusual, beautiful picture. A bar graph conveys the same message effectively, but it may not be as attractive to the eye. So if you're going to these people's workshops or reading this book, you're probably thinking, oh, I guess I should be making charts like these, right? No, you shouldn't be making charts like these. I had to have two appearances by Lewis Black. Let me give you some second opinions on these charts, okay? Here's something from marketing guru, Seth Godin wrote, um, uh, um, uh, Permission Marketing, The Practice, This Is Marketing, brilliant guy. Here's what he thinks about it. I think this is one of the worst graphs ever made. He's, Tufty, is very happy with it because it shows five different pieces of information on three axes. And if you study it for 15 minutes, it really is worth a thousand words. I don't think that what that is what graphs are for. I think they try to make a point in two seconds for people who are too lazy to read the 40 words underneath. By the way, um, Dr. Stephen Costin, the former chair of the Department of Psychology at Harvard University, um, uh, writes that he thinks that the Menard chart violates tons of the principles of cognition. And um, one of my colleagues decided to take the same Menard data and using modern tools, um, did a makeover of it. And, and here's what he came up with. And I, I think this gets the, the point uh, across very quickly. Obviously, this is a tongue in cheek rendering of this thing. But there is something about the immediate takeaway in using this pie chart from this. Um, I would probably argue, well, who's our audience? What do they need to know? I'm going to get to that in a second. Very, very important. If you read about Charles Menard, and there's a great book called The Menard System by Sandra Rangren, and Menard made more than just that one chart, and some of his charts really have great business use. There was an expectation of the person viewing his charts. It was, this is, you know, extremely well-educated, you know, on a drawing table. And when they were looking at his charts, they would have a ruler in hand so they could measure the size legend against things in the chart, a ruler in hand. Can you imagine somebody looking at um, the Nightingale uh, wedge chart and, you know, showing that to a busy executive 
and and the executive going, wow, this looks amazing. Where's my protractor? I want to really study this thing. That's not going to happen. But they both knew their audience as well. Nightingale really knew her audience well and why she created that chart. She was designing that chart for the vulgar public, which she defined as Queen Victoria, Prince Albert, and various heads of state. Menard knew who his audience was, which brings me to this. Before writing the big book of dashboards with Jeff Schaefer and Andy Cotgreave, a dear friend recommend I read this book, Badass, Making Users Awesome. By the way, this is what the major takeaway of the book is. People don't want to be badass at using your tool. They want to be badass at what using your tool allows them to do. That wasn't my takeaway from the book. My takeaway was, how is what I'm doing, what I'm writing, what I'm presenting, going to help my audience? What is it that they want? What do they need? What are they looking for? It now informs everything I do. So here's a typical agenda slide. This stuff drives me nuts, right? You see stuff like this all the time. What is it that your audience is looking for? Come on, they're looking for this. You know, so think about that. What is the, you know, highlight the things that they're, make it easier for them to find the thing. So if I could leave you with one overarching thing of all the things I said about um, why numbers are not enough and why bomb uh, bar charts are the bomb and the effective use of color, um, uh, putting your stakeholder, make your audience the, the hero of your dashboard, always be thinking about who is your audience, what's the message, and it has taken me 15 years to distill what I do down to a single sentence. And I, and I would argue this is what you should be doing as well. You're here to provide the greatest degree of understanding with the least amount of effort. That's for your audience. You may have to work really hard, but you want them to understand stuff without having to work hard. So, hey, I'm happy to continue the discussion and also have a little reveal for you today. Um, so my website is datarevelations.com. I'm at data revelations. There's my email. So if you disagree with me, hey, send me a note. We can do some Q&A and some chat type of thing. We'll try to uh, have a discussion go on for a little bit. And also excited that today, the book that I've been working on for the last two years is now available. And you can find it or download um, a free sample from it from bigpick.me. So, hey, I would, uh, Sean, it took over a year to make this happen, but delighted that we were finally able to uh, uh, get together. And thank you all for joining me today. Why don't I stop sharing the screen? And if, um, if we've got some questions, um, so I'm, I'm focusing on the presentation. I'm not able to uh, monitor what's going on sure. in chat. So if anything is interesting has happened there, please bring it to my attention. Yeah, so that was really great. Um, we did have a couple, uh, we had some good comments go on, um, which was good. Uh, so definitely scroll through those as, if you're if you're able to. But um, the uh, we did have one question come up uh, through the Q and A, and then I, I had a few that I kind of jotted down as I, as I was listening. Um, so the first one that came up is talking about how thinking about this big picture and how do you put how do you where how and where do you put C-suite executives in there when you've got to make a dashboard for similar similar domains, similar questions, but you've got one audience that is a C-suite level executive, and then one people, and then you've got another set of audience who is maybe obviously lower down on the totem pole who, who have more distinct questions. Um, and what what kind of advice would you give to speak to that? The, the it's it's pretty hard to create you know it's a large organization a one size fits all mm -hmm. dashboard you know the things that are really important uh, to the executive may not be as important to um or or the what the, the executive wants to focus on may be different than a line manager um so trying to create this one size fits all thing may be pretty difficult to do um, the thing is, what is it that each one of them needs? 
And what is the thing that keeps each of them up at night? Now, it's easy for me to say, gee, you should be collaborating with uh, and hobnobbing with and working with the executive. Um, if that can happen, if you can have that type of understanding, some great stuff happens when your stakeholders become your collaborators. Um, short of that, you need some type of proxy for this. But if you have no clue what they want to see and what's meaningful to them, then my guess is your dashboard may you know, then, then you're then you're hoping that you got it right. Mm -hmm. So you've 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 got to know what are the things the person needs to see and what is the way to present it to make it as digestible as possible. Yeah. Also, Sean, I don't know if you feel this way. You know, I always try to create a data visualization that doesn't require explanation. Mm -hmm. you know, do I have to explain? Sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes some charts like you know a waterfall chart may be the perfect way to get something across, but this person may not know how to read a waterfall chart. By yep. the way, that's something I think is always holding. No one wants to come off as stupid. You know, so right. rather than say, gee, I don't know how to read this thing. Hey, I just want to see the numbers. Your, your organization has to have a safe space for, um, hey, can you take a minute to explain to me how this works? Or maybe you have a little video that explains how to read the chart. Yep. So, uh, David, your, your question is really well taken, and I don't have a quick answer, but uh, it's not easy to make a one-size-fits-all dashboard. Yeah, yeah, I would, uh, I would just say that um, in, in my experience, um, I can, it's really, it's really easy to get people to tell you what they want when you show them what they don't want. <laughs> Right. Uh, and, and I've I've run into that so many times where I've, I've asked, hey, what 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 kind of things are you wanting to get out of it? And they don't maybe their questions are vague, you know, or they don't they just literally just don't respond to you. So then so what I'll do is I'll just make something and then I'll shoot it over to them and then be like, well, this is not what I wanted at all. But now I've got them. Right. It's like, OK, well, then tell me what you want. And then and then, you know, so it may take a little while to get them actually hooked. But once you get them, um, then you can kind of go from there. It's shown, so I'd be curious what you think. There's, there's a chapter in the book devoted to the importance of collaboration. Mm -hmm. And in fact, turning your stakeholders into collaborators, your audience actually being actively helping shape the charts and dashboards, which is something I thought would never work. I thought, wow, this is a... Um, I, I learned a lot from writing the big book of dashboards with Jeff and Andy because I got feedback and pushback and it worked because you know, we weren't trying to make art. It wasn't like a band that's going to break up because we're uh, having artistic differences. Yeah, mm -hmm. man, I want to play jazz now. I want to stop doing pop stuff. <laughs> it was none of that. And it was, oh, this is so much better. But also I got schooled when with the, the, somebody brought me down to work with a client in, in Nashville, this company, um, I'm not gonna say what they manufactured, but kind of led a whole clinic on how to have kind of the C-suite and the people selling the stuff and the stakeholders kind of available to chime in. I thought, oh, this is gonna be terrible. You're gonna have all these people saying, no, make it this way. There's an old, old adage that a camel is a horse designed by a committee. And, um, <laughs> And I thought that was what was going to come out of this. And it wasn't. It was really, really great because the person who was kind of leading the collaboration. So there's a way to get the, your audience to be active in it and to be active in it before you've spent six months making something. And then they come back and go, that's not working. So you just kind of said, you know what, let me do something quickly so they can immediately dismiss it as no, that's not what I want. But it only took me a few hours. And now we're having a dialogue. That's a exactly. really good. That's a really good addition to the strategy, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So thank you, David, for that question. Anybody else? Is, if you've got questions, go ahead and drop them in the Q and A. Uh, so as I was kind of listening, um, I did have a couple questions. Um, where did the name Cleveland dot plot come from? Like, why does Cleveland get recognition? Is is it Cleveland the place, or is Cleveland it's William person? Cleveland? Okay, uh, Cleveland it. and McGill. Got it. Okay, good. You know, I was I was curious. Is, yeah. So um, yeah, it's not, it's, 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 you know, it's not, you know, 
it's it's it, it's not from spinal tap um, <laughs> right <laughs> exactly and then lastly um i just would give a shout out for your show me my dot uh the uh the visualization that you did uh where you you the jitter plot where you have their dot and you just it's right there uh, i've used it several times and it, it is always a hit um and it is it's something that everybody always enjoys seeing is like okay here's me and then here's where i fit with within all of the other things and um if you have the if you ever have the chance to use one um it is it is definitely a chart that you will get uh lots of lots of positive feedback uh on so and i really like the addition of the uh the arrow or the showing direction uh of year over year the progression of change that was that's a really interesting i hadn't kind of i hadn't considered um adding that piece of it to it so that was that was really cool that's the, 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 the comets the comet chart yes um, and and it, the, the you know part of it is you you know for high performers it's great to show them look how well you're doing Mm -hmm. um, for for people that are underperforming or not performing optimally, you know, it can be probably discouraging, and you want to try to show, hey, you've made progress. You know that the, the 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 hey, I know it's bad, but let's let's put together a plan and try to make this better. And showing here's where you were, and now here's where you went to. It's that's got to be a really nice, um, well shot in the arm which seems to be what everybody wants these days so uh yeah uh, cool and then the last question i had um is making the distinction and how do you go about making the distinction between a you know these truly the difference between explanatory dashboards and exploratory where you're you don't really you know making and thinking about the big picture in in those terms is like i'm making an exploratory dashboard i'm going in i don't really have maybe i don't have a really well-defined question um where the audience you know it's really hard to put somebody in the audience uh or put a person from the audience in the dashboard how can you what are some things some strategies you've got for exploratory type of i'm this is a delightful question because i've been giving a lot of thought to this over the years and i'm going to say something um, which may be controversial i think it is just fine to make a, um, a really boring dashboard but the presentation you build around the findings from the dashboard that should be riveting so let me explain the distinction so years ago before the big book of dashboards came out um, the um, I attended Cole Nussbaumer Naflick's uh, Storytelling with Data workshop. Um, she's written Storytelling with Data. It's one of my favorite books. And I remember, you know, just going, why does anybody need what we're about to make this book? This workshop is so great. The book is so great. And then it, she used this metaphor for giving a presentation and uh, where people stumble, say, you know, you know, you have to shuck a lot of oysters to find a pearl. When giving a presentation, just show the pearl. Don't show everybody every friggin' oyster that you shucked. And I realized, well, a dashboard can be an automated oyster shucker, mm -hmm. something that helps you find where the pearls are much faster. So that's your exploratory dashboard, something that helps you find something amazing that no one else has seen in the data. What you then do with it, well, do you just give them the same exploratory thing with, with some guidelines and say, hey, what happens when you click here? Holy crap, right? Or do you do story points? Or mm -hmm. do you curate the thing in a presentation? I'm fine, by the way, with static PowerPoint presentations buttressed with, oh, but if you now want to try something else, oh, we looked at this category, but you want to look at that category? Instead of making a deck with 500 slides in it for every friggin' permutation, go, well, let me show you this thing where you can do some exploratory analysis on your own. Mm -hmm. So the, the, um, the, the, this notion of I have to make this amazing whiz bang thing, I don't think so. I think the dashboard is to help you find something amazing. And then what you do with that 
Maybe it's a story point. Maybe it's scrolly telling. Maybe it's a dashboard. Maybe it's a presentation. I don't know. Yeah. Depends yeah. on your audience. That's right. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned uh, you mentioned Tableau story points. I feel like that's that is a hotly debated feature within uh, within the product. Uh, some most people hate it. Some people love it. Um, curious what your thoughts are. The um, just seeing a, a, you know a couple of things here from John in the chat. Um, so comma charts are super easy to make, and jitter plots and some other things. You can kind of say, how do I create a comma chart in Tableau? Boom, you'll find you'll find stuff on my website, but lots of other websites as well. Um, so the I kind of fall in the gee, I'm a little disappointed with story points. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. That I was expecting it to be more guided analytics, because you know the story is okay, you're following my story, the story I want you to see, mm -hmm. which could be great. So what would happen is you'll go to what made the first part of the story and there's some filters and stuff. Oh, I don't wanna look at what this person wants me to look at. I'm gonna click this and do that, oh, wow. Then you go to the next place in the story and it's like, I don't care if you click something over there. <laughs> we're telling the story the way I wanted the story, I, the author, wanted it to be told. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that was that was not how I expected it to behave. Yeah. So um, we're, you know, you know this, this great, amazing thing, I rarely see it used. Um, what's your take on it, Sean? I, I agree. Um, I'm the same way. I feel like, um, I feel like it's, it's, I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's a breakdown between how people are using it or how people have been taught to use it. Um, and because there are some, there are some really amazing examples of using it. I know Andy kreebel has got one on interruptions during the, during Supreme court um, oral arguments. That is just, is just really, really nice. That it's, it's basically, it's one chart. Um, it's a highlight table. And then he, each step shows the different intersections of these, of each judge and who's talking and who interrupted who. It's a really great, there's several more out there. Um, but I do think if you're using it as a, you know, if, if you're using story points as showing different, uh, different ways to view the data, then I feel like that's not necessarily the right use case. But if you're showing, um, you know, it's kind of, you're almost kind of using static images, static, but yet dynamic, because you can still interact and click um, to actually show, hey, here's, here are some things that I found. It may or may not be useful to you. So one of the ways that I'll use it for clients is I'll use it as kind of a training tool to be like, okay, when you click here, look, look at what it does. So I want to, you know, you, you almost kind of frame it as, I have a question and then I would show you how to use story, using story points, how to get to answering that question by clicking and filtering and, and doing those kinds of things. So it's, it's, um, it is an interesting, uh, it is an interesting way. I feel like it, when used properly, it can be a pretty powerful tool, I would say. Uh, pretty powerful. No, no disagreement. Yeah. So cool. Uh, all right, so I know we've got uh, a few more trivia questions to finish up uh, before we before we wrap. So we'll go ahead and get back. Is there? Sean, yeah, I've, go ahead. I've, I've got a uh, hop off. Thank you okay. all for hosting me today. Hope to see people in person, and then um, you'll let me know. You know who the. Uh, you know, the, the, you know, they may say, no, just give me the gift card, not the book. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Uh, no, yes. Uh, as soon as, yes, as soon as restrictions have eased up, we have a barbecue plate and a fresh cold IPA waiting for you here in Kansas. Oh, my gosh. Oh, uh, 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 be still my heart. That's right. Sean, thank you. Cool. Thank everyone from, from, from uh, one of the best tugs uh, ever. Thanks so uh. much. Appreciate it. Take care, Steve. All right, Kansas City. Let's uh, let's finish up this, uh, and we will uh, let's finish up this trivia, and we'll get going here. So we'll share. 
while we're doing this, uh, Lucas, any uh, any thoughts? Any? I apologize. He jumped off. Um, any any thoughts on anything you saw? Can you hear me, Sean? Yep. No, I think I think it's a great opportunity to get kind of a a training session here in this in this form for free. So yeah, it's very very excited that we had that opportunity to go through that. So many nice examples. I, I shared the jitter plot. The the whole trending um, was really nice, showing the mm -hmm. flow. That's not something I normally do. So it's I was glad to see that, and we'll be able to leverage it. So it was yeah. a, a really good one hour um, presentation. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, here we go. Here we go. Let's finish up this trivia. All right, Blue Camel, let's see if you can keep your lead. All right, here we go. Next question. Get ready. Multi-select. What are the two most precise free attentive attributes? Color and hue, width and shape. Uh-oh. There we go. There's some answers. There we go. Width and shape. Correct, correct answer is length and hue are the two most, most precise. Uh, all right, here we go next. Oh, yep. Hey, Brave Tiger coming on up. Here we go. Let's finish this up. Which chart type is more acceptable to truncate your axis? If you're gonna truncate your axis, which one do you do it to? Bar chart or line chart? Line chart, never start your bar, rarely, rarely ever start your bar charts, not at zero. Um, can be very misleading. So, all right, next. Melodic Urchin, love that username. Blue Camel coming back. Here we go. Invented in 20, 2005, Stephen Few created the bullet chart as an alternative to which novelty chart? Which chart type replace, which, which chart type did Stephen Few try to get rid of with the bullet chart? Yes, the gauge chart. Too many gauge charts. Um, basically, a gauge chart is just a half a, half a pie chart, right? So bullet charts show, uh, uh, performance to target, essentially, right? But in a straight line. All right, three more questions, two more questions. A lot of urchin, keeping up. Remember, we're playing for a free copy of, who came up with the design mantra? Overview first, zoom and filter, and then details on demand. This is somebody's mantra. Schneiderman's mantra. Yes, Schneiderman's mantra. 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 Ugh, can't talk. Overview first. Zoom and filter. Then details on demand. No change. Very cool. Here we go. Which of these tasks is not best practice in regards to guided analytics. Not a best practice. Interesting. We don't want, I think what, I think what we're trying to get here is we don't want the, we don't want a data table as a default. Right, so that's kind of a spreadsheet view as the default. All right, last question. Here we go. Despite using red and green, someone with color blindness can still differentiate if it is green and a dark red, true or false? Yes, if you change the saturation of the greens and the reds, they can still tell the difference. Uh, so there's a very cool, I will take this moment to tell you uh, about a free cool Chrome app that you can download 
onto your Chrome web browser. Uh, it is called, let me see what it is real quick. It is called Spectrum. So if you go to the Chrome web store, it's called Spectrum. Uh, and it is a free uh, web tool that you can click on and you can see uh, what your visualization looks like, um, or not just visualization, what every single web page looks like through the eyes of someone who has CVD and uh, of the different types. So what I like to do is I'll create a dashboard, publish it up to the server, uh, and then look at it in the browser. And then I'll turn on the spectrum and I'll cycle through all of the different, um, I'll cycle through all of the different colorblind uh, options that they have, and I'll be able to check to make sure that my colors don't contrast uh, too bad. Additionally, another really great um, another really great tool that you can use is called Web Aim, uh, and it is it's a color contrast checker. Uh, so if you're checking to make sure that your light grays and you're uh, against a dark black background have enough contrast for people to read. Uh, and when it comes to uh, web standards, uh, web aim is a great way to uh, great way to check that out as well. So uh, be sure to check that out. All right, here's the big reveal. Who is going to get a copy of Steve Wexler's book? Dun, 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 dun. Jolly Gazelle. In third place, Blue Camel in second. And Melodic Urchin, number one. Very good. So if you are those users, please send me an email at Sean, S-E-A-N dot Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R at Cerner. I will drop that email in the chat and we can, uh, we can go from there. Uh, so send me an email, say, hey, that was me. I was that person. Melodic Urchin, you are going to get a copy of Steve's new book, as well as a $50 gift card to the Tableau gift store. Uh, and Blue Camel and Jolly Gazelle, you each get a $25 gift card. So great job. Congratulations. We are almost done, so don't go anywhere. Um, I did want to quickly uh, talk about our next meetup. Our next meetup has been decided uh, and announced, well, not announced, the web page is not up yet, but save the date for the afternoon of June 22nd. We're gonna have a new, another KC Tug meetup. This one's gonna be all about design and color. Uh, so Evolytics has, uh, has some really cool stuff uh, that they're gonna share about using color and creating custom color palettes. Uh, and then we're also going to do some uh, some design speed tipping. So everybody loves speed tips. Uh, so we're going to do some design focused speed tips as well as learn about custom color palettes and how to use uh, some design best practices in your dashboards. So save the date, June 22nd. As always, you'll get an email, probably multiple inviting you to them. Uh, and uh, we will, uh, we'll hope to uh, see everyone there. Lucas, any parting thoughts? No, Sean, I think that's that's it for me. Looking forward to next month and sharing what Evolytics has done with that without any spoilers, but the, the color tool, which is pretty cool. Cool. All right. All right, Kansas City, that wraps it up for here. Thanks so much. We will talk to you next month.